today I'm going to tell you guys how to set up your Fujifilm X106 for the first time if you just unbox this camera and you need to set all of the settings. I highly recommend watching this video completely through because it's going to tell you how to set your settings to your preference and most of these are set and forget settings which means you set these once and you'll never have to set them again. This video is going to be very fast paced. We're going to go over all the settings you need to set in this camera and skip over all the ones that you don't need. Once you watch this video that tells you how to go over all of the settings inside of your camera for the first time, you can hop into the next video which is going to tell you how to set up all of the custom recipes and film simulations in this camera. But without further ado, if this is your first time setting up your camera, this is the video for you. Let's hop right into it. The first thing we're going to do is walk through all the buttons on the Fujifilm X100VI. After that, we're going to go through the menu system, set everything up for this camera, and then at the end, we're going to walk through the buttons of the camera again to see how they work. So first up, we have the top of the camera, and as you can see, we have some logos of the Fujifilm X100VI. Next to that, we have the hot shoe. Right here, we can attach accessories or we can even attach a flash to these contact points. It just has to work with the Fujifilm system. Next to that, we have the shutter speed dial. We can change here. And then we can also pull this button up and we can change the ISO, which is inside of this shutter speed dial. Then we have the on off lever, which is located right here. And then right next to that, we have the shutter button, which can be half pressed or fully pressed. The shutter button on this camera is threaded, which allows you to put customizable shutter buttons like the one that I have in here right now. Then we have our first custom button, which is right here. And then we have the exposure compensation wheel, which we can turn here. On the front of the camera, we have the aperture wheel, which we can change here. And then we have the control ring, which we can turn here. Looking at the front of the camera, we have our front command dial here, which can also be pushed in. And then we have our second customizable function button right here. And above that, we have a selector, which can be pushed to the left and to the right. In the middle, we have the flash unit. And on the right side, we have the viewfinder, which can be turned from an optical viewfinder to an electronic viewfinder, and even into a hybrid viewfinder. And then the front of this camera, we can see the lens details, which is a 23 millimeter F2, which when you apply the crop factor is basically a 35 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. The front of this lens also has a removable thread, which then you can thread on hoods or adapters, which allow you to use filters. The bottom of this camera has a thread, which allows us to attach tripods or tripod plates. And then to the left here, we have a battery door, which has the battery that can be replaced and also has an SD card reader, which can be replaced. On the right side of the camera, we have a flap that can be lifted, and then we can see we have a microphone and headphone adapter. We have a USB-C port, which can be used for charging and transferring images. And then we have a micro HDMI port, which can be used for exporting video to a monitor. On the left side of the camera, we can choose between our focus and modes, and we can choose between a single focus, a continual focus, or a manual focus. On the left side of the ring, we have a diopter. This can be adjusted in case you wear glasses, and then this will make the image clear dependent on your eyesight. Then we have the viewfinder, which can be switched from the optical, hybrid, or electronic viewfinder. And then we have a sensor system, which when you raise your face to the camera, will automatically switch between the screen and the viewfinder, depending on where your face is. We then have the drive button, which allows you to choose the mode of the camera. And then we have the AEL and AFL button, which stands for auto exposure lock or auto focus lock. Then to the top right, we have our rear command dial, which like the front command dial can be turned or pressed in. Going down the right side row of buttons, we have the focus lever. Some people will call this a joystick. This can be moved in any direction and even pressed in as a button. We then have the menu and OK button. We have the play button. And then we have the display and back button. And then the last button that we have on the camera is the Q button, which allows us to get into the quick menu. And then if you wanted to adjust the screen of the X100VI, you can lift here in the bottom left and adjust that to your view and angle. 
All right, next up, we are going to turn the camera on and click the menu button. This is gonna get us into our menu pages and we're gonna go through this. I'm gonna walk through this camera as a photographer's camera. This is not gonna go over any of the video modes because I never plan to use this camera for video. There are much better video cameras. This camera is very capable for video, but this is not gonna go over video settings. I'm also going to go over the most important settings and I'm gonna give you guys a few options depending on how you want to use this camera and how I am gonna use this camera. So feel free to copy all of my settings if you shoot exactly like me, but if you don't, then feel free to pick the best setting for you. So the first menu page that we see is the image quality setting page. And in here we can select the image quality. I'm gonna be shooting raw because I like to edit my images after, but if you're gonna be using this camera for JPEGs and you want to use all the film simulations, then you're gonna to want to select the fine mode. If you select the fine mode, then you can select your image size, and I highly recommend to select the large three by two because that is the biggest mode. And then if you want to maybe edit your images, but you also want to shoot the JPEGs with the Fujifilm simulations, you can go in here and select fine plus raw. If you do plan on shooting JPEGs, I recommend to keep it in the JPEG mode. This is the standard right now. You could select the HEIF, and this is a little more efficient, but it's not a wide standard yet, so I recommend still shooting with JPEG because this is the most common to use and share. If you're unsure which category you fall into, if you're gonna be using this camera very casually and just with the simulations and then sharing your image, I recommend just choosing fine. If you're not sure if you're gonna be a more serious photographer down the road, then fine plus raw is gonna be your best bet because you'll get the JPEGs now, but then later on you can edit your images to the full capability. And if you just are going to be a photographer that edits your photos right away and you don't care too much about the simulations, then you're gonna select raw. For raw recording, we're going to leave this at uncompressed. The next set of settings are very important and they relate to the Fujifilm simulations and the Fujifilm custom recipes that you can put inside of this camera. These are very important and you're constantly going to be tweaking these. So that is gonna be a whole separate video that you can reference over and over again. This video is mainly gonna go over all of the settings of the camera so you can watch this video once, set your camera up once, and then you could watch the Fujifilm simulation video and that's gonna go over how to constantly change your film simulations to get a nice JPEG image. I will go over these sections quick, but I'm not gonna be changing anything here because that is gonna be for a different video. So film simulation is one of the big selling points of the camera. In here, Fuji allows you to choose between a ton of different looks right off the bat. But if you're shooting raw, these don't matter that much. I'm just gonna be choosing the new film simulation, the Reala Ace, to test it out. Grain effect is the texture of an image. In here, you could select all of the grain. Once again, we're not gonna be selecting this because there's gonna be a whole video on that. Color chrome effect impacts the saturation of certain colors in an image, such as the greens. And this can be selected in weak or strong to improve the colors. For this sake, we're gonna leave this off. Color chrome effect blue is the exact same as the color chrome effect, but this specifically relates to the blue saturation. Once again, we are going to leave this off. Smooth skin effect is going to smooth the skin. We are going to leave this off. White balance, if you're shooting JPEGs, is very important. You're going to want to select what is the situation you are in, such as daylight or shade. But if you're shooting raw, you can change this after on your computer. So for me, who's shooting raw, I'm going to leave this at auto. If you are shooting JPEGs, before you take a set of images, you should set it to daylight or shade or fluorescent or incandescent. And just make sure that you're shooting in the proper white balance because you can't change this to the extent you can with a raw file. So we'll leave this at auto since I'm shooting raw. You can also shift the white balance so if the images come out too cool you could pull it down to the yellows or if you want a little bit of green in your white balance you could pull that to the green. But for me once again the white balance isn't something that I have to change. For most people if you're shooting JPEGs I would say either leave it right in the middle or pull it a little to the warm side. It's going to give it that nice nostalgic and warm effect that a lot of people like. For dynamic range, you can choose between a set of options here. I'm just going to leave this on auto. Dynamic range priority, we're always going to leave off. Tone curve allows you to pull the highlights and shadows of your image, so you could either make the image more contrasty if you pull these both up, or you can make the image less contrasty if you pull both of these down. For color, this is saturation of the whole image, and this could be either taken away or added. You're going to leave this at zero. For sharpness, this can be added or taken away, and we're gonna leave this at zero. 
high ISO noise reduction. At zero, it actually adds a little bit of noise reduction. If you wanted no noise reduction, you would go down to minus four. But for the sake of this, we will also leave it at zero. Clarity is an important setting if you want to get that dreamlike effect. If you pull this down, it's going to make your image very dreamy. And if you raise it up, it kind of works like sharpness and it's going to really enhance your image. Most people are going to want to pull this down. But when you do this, it will impact the process and speed of your camera, and it may make it seem slow and clunky, so we'll leave that at zero. Lawn exposure noise reduction is really only used for lawn exposures above 1 second, 5 seconds, 10 seconds, so usually we're going to leave this off. For color space, similar to the JPEG and HEIF arguments, you get a little more colors with Adobe RGB, but sRGB is more standard, so we're going to keep it at sRGB. Pixel mapping we don't have to mess with. Select custom settings and edit custom settings. This is going to be a part of the whole video. And now I'm going to go back and show you all of the settings that impact in custom settings and relate to Fujifilm recipes. So the most important things inside of Fujifilm recipes are the film simulation, the grain effect, the color chrome effect, the color chrome effect blue, the white balance, the dynamic range, the tone curve, the color, the sharpness, the high ISO noise reduction, and the clarity. All of these are essential to select in custom settings, edit in, and save in custom settings. And we're going to have a whole video on that because that's going to be a constant change in part of your Fujifilm camera. You can set up to seven of these custom settings, and you're going to be want to constantly change in these. So we're going to have a whole separate video on this. But for now, now you know what all of these settings do. If you wanted to set it, you can set it now. But I recommend waiting until that other video and just going through and doing all the one-offs of your camera and then going to the next video. And then you'll see why we chose not to set the custom settings yet. For auto-update custom setting, I'm going to disable this. I don't want the camera to auto-update my setting without me knowing. If I wanted to update it, I will manually do it by going into the edit and save custom setting function. So a quick recap of the image quality settings page is the important things here are the image quality. If you're a casual shooter, you want to select the fine and you want to make sure that you're shooting those JPEG images. And then you will eventually select all of your custom settings, which will be in the next video. If you are a raw shooter, then you really don't have to worry too much about the simulations or anything else. And you just have to leave all of these to zero like I am, and you're gonna get the best quality file. And then you can edit that on your computer after. If you're unsure if you want to be a professional photographer that edits or just a casual person and a hobbyist, then you could select the Fine Plus Raw, which is gonna give you the best of both worlds at the cost of storage. Now we're gonna move on to the autofocus and manual focus settings page. This page is important because you wanna set this up once and then never have to deal with it again. For focus area, you can select where your focus point is. For me, 90% of the time, it's going to be in the center. Unless I tripod my camera up and then I have to focus on something in the corner, I'll just use this focus lever here, which is gonna allow me to change it. When you press in the focus lever, it will go back to the middle. So if you get too far away, just press the button and it'll go right back in. For autofocus mode, this comes down to personal preference. You can choose single point, zone, wide tracking, or all. I choose single point because I like to just focus on one thing and make sure that the camera is focusing on that. This comes down to me not using cameras in the past that had great focus in with auto zones and wide tracking. So I find single point is good because I can trust myself to focus the camera. For zone custom settings, you could set what you want your custom zone to look like. For me, I set it to three by three, which you could see here, seven by seven and 13 by nine. There's a good chance I'll never use these settings, so I'm just gonna go through this. For AF mode, all settings, we're just gonna leave this at the default. For AFC custom settings, we can go in here, and this is gonna allow you to select your tracking sensitivity and speed of your tracking sensitivity. And having tracking sensitivity in the middle and having the speed of the tracking sensitivity be zero, I think is fine for me. It is a good multi-purpose, but you can see what they set here. For set two, it's ignore obstacles and continue to track the subject. Set three is for accelerating and decelerating subjects. Set four is for suddenly appearing subjects. Set five is for erratically moving and accelerating and decelerating subjects. Or you can come in here and set your own. But for me, one at multi-purpose is perfect for me, and that's what I'm gonna go with. Store AF mode by orientation, we're gonna leave this off. AF point display, we are going to leave off. 
wrap focus points. This is for if you bring your focus point all the way to the end of the screen, just like Pac-Man, it would pop up on the other side and keep going. For me, I disable this because I don't want to get my focus point lost when I go to a side, so I'm just disabling that. Number of focus points, I'm going to leave at 117. 425 is too much, and it just takes too long to move the focus point if you have those. Pre-autofocus, I have at off. The autofocus illuminator, I have it off, but if you are in the nighttime, you could potentially turn this on and it will help you out. For face and eye detection settings, I set this to off. And for subject detection settings, I set this off. This is for the same reason I didn't choose the zone autofocus. I just trust myself more than the camera to get the autofocus right, so I'm gonna leave these all off. For autofocus plus manual focus, I turn this off. And for manual focus assist, I turn this off. I'm not gonna be manual focusing with this camera, so all of those are gonna be off for me. For interlock, manual focus assist, and focus rain, I have this at off for the same reason. For focus check, I have this at off. For the interlock spot auto exposure and focus area, I'm just leaving this at on. For instant autofocus setting, I'm sending to autofocus single. For the depth of field scale, I set this to pixel. So this is an important setting for Fujifilm cameras and it is the release and focus priority. Here if we go in, we can see we have the autofocus single and the autofocus continuous and what the priorities are set to each. If the priority is for focus, then your camera might feel a little slow because it won't take the picture until the camera thinks that it's in focus. For release priority, the camera is going to take the photo when the shutter button is pressed down. Your camera is going to feel a lot more snappy, but when you review your images, you might have a lower hit rate because the images might not be in focus. For me, it makes sense the way that they set the camera up because in autofocus single, we want to make sure that the one photo we're taking is going to be in focus. And if we have autofocus continuous, we want to make sure that if we're shooting a bunch of burst shots, that we're taking that shot over and over again to make sure that we capture the correct moment. For autofocus range limiter, we're turning this off because I don't want to range the amount of distance that my autofocus can go to, because if I forget to turn this off again, then I might feel like my camera's broken if it can't focus to infinity or if it can't focus really close because I limited the range. For touchscreen mode, I turn this off because I don't like to trigger my camera in any way by accidentally touching it. If you go in here, the one that's going to make the most sense to most people is the autofocus touch because that's like touching the screen of your iPhone to get focus. Touch shooting I think is the worst because you're accidentally going to trigger your camera a lot. And I don't really know what area does because I just keep this off because I don't want to do anything. I want to focus with the shutter button or the autofocus button and I really just don't want to focus with my finger. For corrected autofocus frame, I'm going to leave this at off. Here's a quick recap of the most important AF and MF settings. We have the autofocus mode, which allows you to choose between single point, zone, wide tracking, and all. For me, I leave this at single point. We have the face eye detection and the subject detection settings. If you are going to be using these, you don't want to forget about them. You're going to have to turn them on and off. So just remember where they are in the settings page. Last up, we have the release and focus priority. You want to make sure if your camera feels a little slow that you have a release priority. And if you're missing a lot of focus, that you have a focus priority. Next up, we are in the shoot and settings menu. And for this, we're going to set the sports finder mode off, pre shots off, self timer off, save self timer setting off, self timer lamp we're going to leave on because if you do choose to use a self timer, then you do want to have the lamp. But personally, instead of using the self timer, I highly recommend using the interval timer. If you use the interval timer, you're going to want to use the in camera timer. And then you're going to go in here and select an interval. Most of the time, I would select three seconds and then I would take an infinite amount of shots and once you set this this camera is just gonna fire off shots at every three seconds it's like a self timer except you have a very high chance of getting the shot because it's gonna fire over and over and over again this is what people do and they constantly change up poses and then you come back to your camera you could have a hundred or so shots and you could choose between all of them if you choose to use the self timer you're gonna have to run back to your camera over and over again you're gonna get sweaty it's gonna be a mess so to use the interval timer it's much more effective for interval timer shoot exposure smoothen i'm just gonna leave this at on for interval priority mode we're gonna leave this off Next up, we're entering our bracket settings. We have the auto exposure bracket settings, the film simulation bracket, and the focus bracket. These I don't use because once again, I like to do it myself. But what the auto exposure bracket can do is it can take one shot at a normal exposure, one shot overexposed, and one shot underexposed. And then you could choose between the three shots to pick out which one is best or you could actually combine these images in an editing app and get a HDR-like image. I don't like doing that. 
Next up is the film simulation bracket, which like the auto exposure bracket, you can choose three different film simulations. It'll take the same photo three different times with three different simulations, and then you could choose which simulation you want. For me, once we set up our custom settings in the other video, we're just gonna set one setting and we're not gonna ever have to bracket our film simulations. For the focus bracket settings, this is good for focus stacking, which is done in an editing software. You can choose to focus close, medium, and then far, and then combine all of those to get an in-focus image from front to back, which is usually not possible. For photometry, this is basically the auto exposure of the camera, and we're gonna want to keep this on multi. For shutter type, we're gonna wanna keep this on mechanical shutter. It's gonna give us a capped shutter speed, but you have to have mechanical shutter to use flash. And if you use electronic shutter, you could also get some weird artifacts in your photo. So right now, mechanical shutter is still the best. For flicker reduction, this could be helpful if you're shooting with lights that flicker. You're usually not gonna notice it to the human eye, but if you go back into your photos, you might notice that the lights look off in your photos when they were on. So for flicker reduction, this is gonna slow down the trigger of your shutter, and it's gonna make sure that your image is taken when the flicker is not in the off setting. It can be helpful, but it's one of those settings you really don't need that often. You could just take the image multiple times and you'll probably get the light on. But if you did remember the setting and you're fine going into the menus to switch it on, then flicker reduction is here and it's a good setting to know about. For ISO auto settings, we're gonna go in here and we could actually customize these settings. I'm just gonna customize one for you guys and then you can see what you want. For me, I'm gonna set the default sensitivity to 125. This is the base ISO of the camera, which means it's going to give us the cleanest images. For max sensitivity, I'm gonna to set to 3200. If I was feeling like I'm shooting in good light, I might set it to 800, but I usually don't wanna to go to 6400 or 12800. The images start to get a little muddy. 3200 is kind of the sweet spot for me, so that's my max sensitivity. For minimum shutter speed, the camera does have an IBIS unit, which means if you're hand holding your camera, you can get a sharp image at a pretty low shutter speed. The issue is if you're moving around, the camera isn't gonna be able to use the IBIS unit effectively. You have to be basically trying to be a tripod to get the IBIS unit to work as most effectively. If you're moving your camera while you're shooting, the IBIS won't really help you that much. So I feel like you could get away with 1 15th of a second at, with the IBIS unit and taking a picture holding it very still. And if you were moving really fast, then you usually wanna be about 1 1 25th because then you could move with your camera and it'll still get a pretty sharp image. But 1 40th of a second is kind of the sweet spot for me, I think, because I'm not pushing it by going to 1 15th and having to hold really still and I'm not doing 1 1 25th so I can move really fast with my camera. This kind of gives me the best of both worlds. I would think about pushing it to 1 60 if I'm getting too many blurry shots, but I'm gonna trust myself to shoot at 1 40th. So for me, these are the auto settings for my ISO, which means once the camera hits 1 1 40th of a second, then it's gonna start bumping the ISO up. Conversion lens, these are attachments that you can add onto the camera. There's a wide conversion lens and a telephoto conversion lens. You aren't really ever gonna turn this on. The camera will turn it on automatically. Just know if you add a conversion lens, you cannot use the flash. For digital teleconverter, this camera is a 40 megapixel sensor, which means you can crop into this image and still get a usable image. For that reason, this camera was technically a 35 millimeter, but you can actually set it to a technically 50 millimeter or a technically 70 millimeter and not lose too much resolution. So you really get three lenses inside of this camera if you remember to use the digital teleconverter. But for me, I'm just gonna leave this off because 35 millimeter is the way I like to shoot. For ND filter, most of the time I'm gonna leave this off. It is a good option to know about, but we're gonna leave this off. For wireless communication, personally, I never want to attach my camera to my phone. I just wanna take the SD card out and move it when I'm done shooting. So I'm not gonna mess with any of the wireless communication settings in this. For the shooting settings menu, the most important things here are the interval timer, which we can use as an improved self timer. And then we have some bracket settings here, which I will not be using. We then have the shutter type, which most of the time we're gonna to want to leave on the mechanical shutter, but we can change that to electronic shutter. We then have the ISO auto settings, which we can change to improve the performance of the camera's auto ISO. There's the digital teleconverter effect, which allows us to choose between different focal ranges. And then we have the ND filter, which can be switched from off to on. For flash functions, as long as we keep all the settings correct on this camera, we are able to use the onboard flash. So if we go into here, 
we can just scroll on the side here and get into TTL. TTL is basically the automatic mode for flash. So if you wanted to shoot flash, just switch this into TTL mode and then you are good to go. There is manual mode, but this can be hard to master. And then there is another mode. I don't even know what this one does, to be honest. And then most of the time you're gonna keep this off unless you want to fill flash with the TTL. You can go down here and play with some of the settings to set to TTL auto, TTL, or TTL slow. For your sync, you can choose between a first curtain or a second curtain. The first curtain is when the camera first opens up, so the flash is gonna happen right away. For a second curtain, the flash is gonna happen towards the rear of your shots. Now, if you're using a long shutter speed, then this will be very important because if you do a front curtain, and then your subject moves, it'll look like the subject is moving away. But if you do a second curtain near the rear, you can have a blurry subject and then right at the end, keep it sharp, which is what some people will do to get like a nice run in shot. But most of the time, you're just gonna keep this on front curtain because your shutter speed's gonna be fast and you wanna just get it right away. You also have some exposure compensation for your flash, but usually you're just gonna leave this at zero. For all of these other flash settings, we're just gonna leave them normal. We're gonna leave this at off and then the TTL lock mode at last flash. And then for built-in flash, we wanna leave this on to make sure that we can use the flash inside of this camera. In the flash settings menu, the most important setting is obviously this first one, the flash function setting, which can be turned from off to TTL, AKA auto. You're gonna be switching between those two modes. If your flash isn't working, there are a few issues. Number one is the drive could be set to continuous or video. The flash will only work if this is in the single shot mode, which is the first selection in the drive. Another issue is if you have a conversion lens on this camera, the flash will not work. And then another issue is if you have electronic shutter set on this camera, it will not work. You need to be on the mechanical shutter. And then the last thing that might not allow you to use your flash is if you have the flash and sound set in turned to off, that's gonna be in a later menu and I will remind you when you see that, but we're gonna to wanna to make sure that that is set on, otherwise the flash won't work. And then also there is the obvious one, which is if you have built-in flash off, this will not work, you want to keep this on. The setup page is a huge menu system and it is filled with some very important settings. So we're gonna hop into user settings first. Format is a very important setting. If you offload your images, you're gonna to wanna to come in here and you're gonna to want to format your card. If you do not offload your images, never come into the format. This will delete all of your images from your card and you will not be able to get them back. So if you do take images off your SD card, then format it. If you never are gonna take images off your SD card, then stay away from the setting no matter what. For area setting, date time, time difference, and language, these are all set up when you first turn on your camera. If you need to rechange them, they can be changed here. For my menu settings inside a photo, we're gonna go in here and we are going to just look at what I set. I set these for the film simulations. This is gonna be for the film simulation video. So set all of these settings before you watch the film simulation video, because this is gonna be very important to easily switch in your film simulations without keeping all of the BS settings in here. So we're gonna go through, number one is image quality. Number two is film simulation. Number three is grain effect. Number four is color chrome effect. Number five is color chrome effect blue. Number six is white balance. Number seven is dynamic range. Number eight is tone curve. Number nine is color. Number 10 is sharpness. Number 11 is clarity. Number 12 is high ISO noise reduction. Number 13 is select custom setting. And number 14 is edit and save custom settings. If you want to add these, you just go into this menu and you can go through and add all of these functions that I just told you. If you accidentally add one, you can go into here and remove them. And if you do want to reorder them so they're the same order as mine, you can rank them and then move them. For my menu settings for video, I'm not gonna go into this because we're not doing any video on this camera. For sensor cleaning, I'm gonna go in here and I turn these off. This is a fixed lens camera, which means technically there shouldn't be any dust getting onto the sensor. So I don't want the sensor moving around too much. So I'm gonna turn these off. And if I ever need to manually clean it, I'll just go in here and click okay, and that will clean the sensor. For shutter count, this is how many shots you've taken with the camera. This is good in case you want to sell it or you're gonna get maintenance. This can give you some ideas how many shots you've taken. For me, it says 200 shots. I don't really know why it says 200 shots because I've never taken a shot with this camera yet. So here is the last setting that's gonna turn your flash off if you accidentally switch this. If you turn this sound and flash to off, it is going to not let you change your flash. This is weird. I think this is if you wanna go in stealth mode with your camera really quick 
but you can manually change your flash and your sound in other places. So don't change this because it's gonna change both of them at the same time and that's not good. Firmware update, if there are updates for this camera, this is where you will go. Reset will put your camera in factory default in case you really mess up your settings or you want to sell your camera. And regulatory is just some electronic information that they usually put inside of cameras. For sound settings, this is all personal preference. For me, I am going to turn all of the sound in this camera off. So just go through this really easy. Off, 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 off. And then playback volume, you can leave this at whatever. This is if you record video. I never record video, so this is technically off. For screen setup, we're gonna go in here and then we're gonna look at the view mode settings. We're gonna leave these at the default and have the sensor choose for us. For bright frame position memory, we're gonna leave this at on. For EVF brightness, we're gonna leave this at auto plus one. EVF color, EVF color adjustment, and then LCD color and LC color adjustment. You never want to change these because that's gonna mean that the colors that you see inside of your camera aren't gonna be what your photos actually are. That's what the film simulations will be for. Do not change the color or color adjustments in these sections. For LCD brightness, this just changes the LCD. I'd usually leave this at zero, but I just want this to be extra bright for the video, so I have it at five. For image display, we have off. For auto rotate displays, I have off. For preview, exposure, and white balance in manual mode, I left this at the default. For natural live view, I have off. For F-Log view assist, this is for video. You can turn it on, but it doesn't really matter. For electronic level setting, I have this at off. For frame and guidelines, I have the standard grid nine, which is the rule of thirds grid. For auto rotate, I have this at off. For focus scale units, I unfortunately have to leave this at feet because I'm American. For OVF image display, I set this to small. For the display custom settings, we're gonna go through this really quick because this is a lot of personal preference, but you have an OVF and an EVF selection here, and this is basically gonna show all of the settings on the camera, like the histogram and the flash. So we're gonna go into the display custom settings, we'll go into the OVF. For me, I'm keeping the OVF as simple as possible. So I turn on focus frame, focus indicator, and then the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO in the first menu. In the second menu, I keep the exposure compensation as a digit, and I keep if the flash is on or off icon. In the third menu, I just have the image size and the quality. And in the fourth menu, I have the no storage media warning and the battery level. This keeps my OVF very simple. For the EVF and LCD, I wanna see a little more information here, but I'm also gonna keep this very simple. I have the frame and guideline, that's gonna show my rule of thirds the focus frame, that's gonna show my image. The focus indicator is going to be the little box. The autofocus distance indicator and the manual focus distance indicator, I leave these off because I don't really care too much about the distance. For the histogram, this is very good to make sure that I'm getting the correct exposure. If not, I can adjust the exposure compensation. For the live view highlight alert, I leave this off because I find that very distracting. For shooting mode, I leave this off because I'm usually in control of my camera and know what's happening. I definitely leave aperture shutter speed and ISO on. I turn information background on, it kind of highlights the information that I have on my camera, makes it easier to read. I keep exposure compensation as a digit again. I don't show the focus mode, photometry, shutter type, but I do show the flash icon again. I turn off continuous mode, dual IS mode, and touch screen mode. I turn the white balance on so I can see what white balance I'm at. I turn off the film simulation, dynamic range, boost mode, and frames remaining. I turn on the image size and quality. I turn off the movie mode, turn off the digital teleconverter, turn off the conversion lens, turn off the communication status, turn off the microphone, turn off the guidance message. I turn on the no storage media warning. And then I turn on the date and time, battery level, and frame and outline. So this is what my very simple LCD will look like. And then if you want it more simple, you could hit the display button. That will take everything out. This will give you a ton of information. And then this is what I set up in the custom screen. For large indicators, I did want to turn this on for the OVF, but it was a little buggy. So I ended up turning this off. I also turned it off for the LCD. If you do need to read a little better, you can turn these on. They just weren't working properly for me, so I think there needs to be a firmware update to fix these. If you want to change what's in the large indicator display settings, 
I just had it so it was showing the exposure and then the scale and then I turned off all of these icons to keep it very simple but once again it was very buggy for me and it wasn't working properly. For the information contrast adjustment this allows you to change in case you're in low lights you can change this to the dark ambient light in mode but most of the time you're going to leave this at standard or high contrast if you like that look. Location information I leave on. For the Q menu background and Q menu background for video, I turn them both to black, just a little more contrast. For button and dial settings, we're gonna start off with a focus lever. This is the button we've been pressing this whole time. And if you push this in, it's gonna center the focus point. And if you tilt it, it's gonna move the focus point. This is exactly what I want it to do and I would never change this. For the photo quick menu, I'm gonna set this up with 16 slots. The first slot is automatically set to show you what mode you are in. And then going from left to right, top to bottom, I have image quality, white balance, flash function, film simulation, grain effect, color chrome effect, color chrome effect blue, highlight tone, shadow tone, sharpness, clarity, color, high ISO noise reduction, dynamic range, and ND filter. So if we go into the main screen here, we can hit the Q button and then we can see all of this information. This is going to be very useful once again when we start using the film simulations in the next video. So you can easily come in here and switch your film simulations. You can go switch your highlight tones very easily. This is a very effective Q menu that I've set up here that allows you to change your simulations on the fly. You're gonna wanna set this up before you watch the next video on film simulations. For the video quick menu, I have eight set up, but we're not gonna go over video. For the function FN settings, these are gonna be our custom buttons. For the first one, I have set right to the right of the shutter button. This is gonna select our custom settings. And then for the function two button, which is next to the selector on the front, this is gonna select the film simulations. This is really easy for me to switch between simulations and custom settings, and I find that very effective. For all of the touch functions, I turn them off because I just don't want to accidentally change something on my camera without me noticing. For the AEL AFL button, I turn this autofocus on. This allows us to do back button focus, which basically means if we don't want to use our shutter button as a focus button, we could switch this to manual mode on the side and then use the AEL AFL button as a back button focus and then easily allow us to select our focus and then lock it into place. I highly recommend using the setting if you want to be a little more serious about your focus in, but if you do want to use the shutter button to focus and take pictures, you can still do that. But for me, it makes more sense to have two buttons, one to focus and one to take the picture. When you push in the rear dial, this is going to zoom into the picture to make sure that you're in focus. For the selector, I turn this off because personally, I just couldn't find anything in this menu that I thought would be an effective use of the selector. So for that reason, I just decided to turn it off. That does not mean that the selector does nothing. When you hold your face up to the viewfinder, you can use the selector to switch between your viewfinder modes, and this becomes the primary purpose for that button. And to be honest, I just want every button to serve one purpose, if not two. So the selector being off here is actually a good thing for me. And then the Q button is going to go into the quick menu. I think that's a perfect application of that. The command dial settings are pretty interesting. You basically can use this camera in two different ways. You can use the labeled buttons or you can turn the labeled buttons off and then you could use these command dials to change your settings. So for me, if you look at the top of this camera, this one dial controls both the shutter speed and the ISO. So for that reason, I have this front dial here. This will also control the shutter speed and if you push that button in, it'll also change the ISO. It'll switch between them every time you press the button on the front. So this button will effectively become this button unlabeled. This is good if you don't wanna look at the numbers and you just wanna quickly switch your shutter speed or your ISO. So I understand why you can do it. And then for the back here, for the same reason, we can turn this aperture dial off and then we can use this button to change the aperture. I wish there was one more button that we could use to control this exposure compensation. It would be nice to have one more button, but since we don't, I just leave it off. You could set this to be exposure compensation, but then you're not switching between the two dials, like I said right here. You're basically switching between three dials by pressing in this button, and that's a little too much for me, so I'll just set my exposure compensation by always using this button. For SS operation, I leave this at on. For command dial direction, I leave this at the default. 
For shutter autofocus, I just leave these both on on. For shutter autofocus, I leave these both at on, and if I want that back button focus, I just switch it to manual mode. For shutter auto exposure, I leave both of these at on. For shoot without card, we turn this off because we don't want to take images if the SD card is not in here. The focus ring direction, I leave at default. The focus ring operation, I leave at the default setting. For control ring setting on the front, for me, I turn this off. I would have liked to set this to something, but I didn't think the options were good for me. Standard just sets it to whatever the camera thinks is best. White balance, I didn't want to set because if I accidentally change that, that's going to be bad. Film simulation could be a good option for a couple people, but like I said, once we do the custom settings in the other video, you won't need to set film simulations that way. Digital teleconverter made the most sense to me because it's like zooming in your lens by turning this control rain. But for me, this is too easy to turn, and I was just switching all of my settings when I didn't want to. So for me, I turned it off. It's a small sacrifice to pay, but I would say digital teleconverter makes sense if you remember to change it back if you accidentally turn it. For the AEAF lock mode, I left this at P. For AWB lock mode, I left this at P. For aperture rain setting, now, this is the most confusing thing to me about the Fujifilm cameras. If you want to use this control rain on the front instead of this dial, you will set this to the T. If you want to have it in auto mode, you set it to A. If you wanted to use this to select the ISO, you select this to C. If you wanted to use the exposure compensation on a dial, you set this to C. The aperture rain has A. It would make sense if they had a C button here also, and then you could select it to the C button and then you could use this back button. But instead, you have to go into the menus and select if you want this A to set the camera into auto mode, or if you want this A to set it into the C. So all of these dials, this is A and T, which is effectively C. The ISO is A and C, and the exposure has zero in C but the aperture rain does not have a C, it only has an A. But you could effectively turn this into a C by going into the menu and changing it into the command mode. For me, Fujifilm just doesn't make too much sense with this because every one of these should just have an A and a C. It should be A and then C. This has an A and a C, so that's good. This is A and T, but that should be a C. And this has zero and C, so it might as well just be A and C. So that's what I think, at least for the design of the camera. But for most people, you're gonna leave this in auto. But if you don't want to use the aperture rain here and you want to use this back aperture like we set up, you have to go to the setting and then select command. But then you can never turn your aperture into auto unless you come back here and put it back into auto. So just remember this setting, it's very important. For function button setting, I just left this at the default. For touch screen settings, I left all of these at the default. And for lock, we're not gonna touch that. For power management, I'm gonna turn the auto power off to five minutes. When I'm doing photography, sometimes it takes a while between photos. So I don't want the camera to turn off unless I'm really not using it for a long time. Performance, I'm leaving this at normal, but you could turn it to boost or economy. For EVF LCD setting, set this to 100p, the rate priority. And then for the auto power off temperature, I set this to high, just in case I'm working my camera really hard. I don't want to turn it off on me unless it's absolutely necessary. For the save data setup, we're going to leave all these at the defaults. You could change the frame number to be a renew, which means every time you format your card, it'll start at one again. But continuous is nice because it's just going to count your shots and you'll never have repeated file names. You can change the file names. You can change the select folder, and you can also change the copyright info if this is important to you. I set it, but I really don't think it does that much. If you are going to set it, just set it to your name and then all rights reserved. But other than that, you really don't have to mess anything with the save data setup page. Now we're going to recap the most important settings in the setup page. First off, in user settings, we have format. That is a very important setting to reset your SD cards if you need to. Next up is the My Menu setting. We're gonna wanna set this up once and then never set it again. Just remember never to turn the sound and flash off, otherwise your flash will not work. And then finally, we have the firmware update. This is important in case there's ever new firmware. In the sound setup, everything here is not that important and we're gonna turn everything off. Inside of the screen setup page, the most important thing that is here is the display custom settings page. And here we can choose what we wanna have on our OVF and our EVF. But other than that, there's not too much more important inside of the screen settings page. For button and dial settings, we have tons of important information in here. We have the quick menu, which we set to 16 functions. We have the function FN settings, which is basically the custom buttons. 
We have the command dial settings. We have shoot without card, which we want to make sure is set to off. We have a very important, albeit frustrating setting, which is the aperture range setting, which we could switch from auto to command, depending on how we want to have it set up. Most of the time it will be in auto, but if you want to use your camera in full manual, then you need to change this to command. Next up for power management, we don't have anything too important here, but you can change these to your Lycan. I do recommend setting power off temp to high, and then depending on your shooting, choose what your auto power off is. For save data setup, the only important thing here is your copyright info. Other than that, that's all for the setup page. For the network USB settings, I'm gonna go in here and we're not gonna change any of these because I never want to really mess with the network or USB settings. I'm never gonna hook this camera up to anything. It is just gonna be a camera for me. For my menu, this is the menu that we set up before. So this is gonna have everything that we went over and everything that we selected before. As you can see, this is gonna make it very easy to select Fujifilm custom settings in the future. So set this menu up before you watch the next video on how to set your own film simulation recipes. All right, so now that we went through the settings, I'm gonna teach you guys how to use your camera effectively so you can understand everything. First off, we have our autofocus modes here. And most of the time you're gonna be in either single or continuous. If you wanna do the back button focus, like I said, you're gonna switch this to manual and then you'll use the AEL AFL button to focus and then you'll use this button to shoot. If you want to focus only with this shutter button, then you're gonna to want to set this to either continuous, which is gonna constantly be focusing until you take your picture, or single, which is going to get one focus and then lock it in. So now that you've selected the way that you wanna shoot, you can select your drive mode. In your drive mode, you could choose between still images and burst and brackets. There are tons of stuff in here and there's even video. But like I said, I'm never gonna be in video. I'm never gonna do panorama or brackets. I might do burst with this camera, but very unlikely. So 99% of the time, I'm just gonna be in the still image and you have to be in still image if you want to use your flash. If we have taken pictures with this camera, we can hit the play button. If we hit the play button, then we can see all the images we've taken and scroll through them using the focus lever. If we hit the play button again, we can see that it takes us back to the other menu. And if we go back into the setting, we could go into the display and this will change between some information. But since we don't have any images, we cannot see that. So we'll just hit the play button again and we'll see our no images. If we do need to change any settings, we could just hit the menu button and then we could go in here and change any settings on the fly. Before you hop into the settings page, there's a good chance you can change things with some of the custom buttons that we set up. If we go into the quick menu here, we can go and switch the camera into a couple different modes and change our image quality and stuff. We can go into our fine JPEG mode if we wanted to, or go back to raw. We can change our white balance easily here to daylight or shade, or we could go back to auto if we trust the camera. We can change our flash to on right from this menu and not have to go to the flash menu settings page. And then we can mess around with all of the fun film effects that we've had down here. We could change the color chrome effect to strong. We could change the sharpness to minus three. We could do a ton down here and we can even turn on the ND filter if we wanted to. So this custom page is gonna be very good for changing some of the most important settings, which is going to be the flash, all of the film simulation effects, and then the ND filter. So this custom page that we set up is gonna be the source of truth for a ton of your problems, and then you will avoid having to go into the menu page for a ton of work. If you want to shoot this camera in auto mode, you're gonna set everything to A. The aperture ring goes to A, the shutter dial goes to A, and the ISO dial goes to A. Once those are all set to A, we are in auto mode, and then the only thing we have to worry about is our exposure compensation. So if the image is too dark, we could go plus one. If the image is too bright, we can go minus one, and then we could just adjust from there. If you wanna go into aperture priority mode from manual mode, all you have to do is change off the A and then select your aperture here. You're now in aperture priority mode and everything else will be auto. If you want to go and choose shutter priority mode from here, you're gonna switch your aperture back to A and then only adjust the shutter dial. You're now in shutter priority mode. If you wanted to go into a program mode on your camera, you could just lift up this ISO dial, select whatever ISO that you felt was necessary, and then your camera will do all of the other programming. If you don't like using these numbered dials, then I will show you how to change into the front command dial and the rear command dial to control your settings. What you're gonna do first is you're gonna select your ISO and you're gonna go into C. This is going to allow you to change your ISO with the front command dial. The next thing that you're gonna do is change your shutter speed into T. 
This is gonna allow it so this front button is now going to change the shutter speed and the ISO. And just like this button controls two things, now when you press in this button on the front here, you'll see that this icon with the wheel is going to switch from these settings. So if I go into the ISO, I can use this to switch. I press the button in and now I can change the shutter speed. The good thing about using these dials is that they have a ton more settings than the numbered ones because these buttons are technically infinite. So you could switch from a ton of different settings by using these kind of buttons. You can go to higher and lower shutter speeds and pick different ones. So it ends up being pretty good in that regard, but it's still a little confusing. If you want the camera to be simple, I'd recommend just using the numbered dial. So now if you want your camera to be in full manual mode, this is the frustrating part. I wish we could just set this to C and that would allow us to do it, but we have to go into the menu. And if I even remember where this is, even though I just showed it, we're gonna have to go into the button dial settings, page two, aperture range settings, commands. Once we do that, that is now going to turn this aperture into a custom. And that custom is going to be on the back here. And you can see now we have that rear dial icon and you can see when I change it, it changes the aperture. So I am going to redo that setting because I do not like it and I don't understand it. Change that back to auto. And then I'm gonna go ahead here, change my shutter speed back to auto and change my ISO back to auto. So now these buttons will not do anything. They will not impact the camera in any way. This push button will not do anything because it's only function was to switch from the ISO to the shutter speed. But this push in button allows us to zoom in on the photo. When we zoom into the photo, that's gonna allow us to see if it's in focus. So this is really effective if you're on a tripod. You could just push this in to zoom into your image, make sure it's sharp, and push it again to zoom out. Now I'm gonna tell you every single way that I'm going to use the Fujifilm X100VI so you can match what fits best. If I'm handing this off to a friend who knows nothing about photography, I'm going to turn AFS on and everything to auto and leave this at zero. That is gonna be so they could just pick up the camera, focus by a half press and take a picture with a full press. It's going to be fully automatic. It's going to be the easiest way to use this camera. If it was at a party, I would do the exact same thing, except I would go into the Q mode here and I would turn the flash on. Then when I get out of here, anyone who picks up this camera is going to take a cool party-like flash photo. So if I'm not handing this camera off to someone and I wanna use it as my workhorse camera, I'm gonna be putting this into aperture priority which means I'm gonna switch that off the auto. Usually I will bounce between F4 and F8. And then I'm gonna switch this camera into manual mode and I'm going to be focusing with a back button focus. So I only have to worry about two things with this camera when I'm using it in this way. Number one is what aperture am I going to set? Number two is what am I going to focus on? So I'll use the focus lever to choose where I want to focus and then I will use the back button focus to lock in my focus. This is going to be the best way and the way that I shoot 90% of the time with this camera. Once again, if I do wanna use aperture priority mode with the flash, I'll just come in here, turn the flash on. This could be good for flash street photography or using fill flash, but most of the time I will leave the flash off. And then the last way I'm gonna use my camera for that 10% of time when I need to be super anal or I'm doing a long exposure or something, if I need to use interval timer, I'm gonna go ahead and set this camera into full manual mode, which is a ton. We're gonna go into the menu again. We're gonna go into the aperture range setting. We're gonna set this to command. Then we're going to go here, switch our aperture over here. That's going to allow us to use the back to switch our aperture. And then we're gonna go into the C mode right here and the T mode here. And now I can use these two dials on my camera to control everything. It is going to be a fully manual experience using these two levers. This will be telling me all of the information on the back here. So we could go here, see everything. We'll see the exposure values. We could tweak these, push this in, change the ISO, push it in, change the shutter speed, change the aperture here, zoom in with by pushing the rear dial. This is going to be a very effective way if you want to manually use this camera. But like I said, most of the time, I'm gonna go into here, put this back into auto mode. Then I'm going to put this onto auto, put this on auto. 
and then switch this back into an aperture priority mode. That's how I'm gonna be most comfortable with this camera. That's how I would use the Fujifilm X106 to its best potential given different scenarios. If you're completely new to this and you just want my honest recommendation to you, I would go with option one. I would set this to S. I would set everything to auto. Once you've set this camera up into the full auto mode, now the only thing you would really have to worry about is your film simulations, and that is all for the next video. But just remember, we set up two custom buttons. One custom button here on the front, which is gonna allow us to easily select which film simulation we want. And then after you take next video's lesson, you'll just push this button right here, and you'll be able to switch between your custom settings on the back here. This is gonna be so when you're on the fly and you're in auto mode, you can easily click this button and switch between seven different custom film settings. So if you're excited for that, go on to the next video, learn about the film simulations, and then you are going to be a master of the X106, and it is going to be an absolute workhorse of a camera for you and anyone that you give it to. So if you like this video, give it a like, give it a subscribe, give it a share, helps a ton with the channel. Thank you guys, and I'll catch you guys in the film simulation video.